Thank you very much, Mark. As always, a very interesting talk that engendered a lot of good discussion. I'd like to now introduce Paul Bob, and on behalf of Sustainable Farming. Thank you, Paul. Uh, thanks for that, Barry, and thanks to everyone for coming along. Uh, Linda on the door said we've got about 150 people here, which is the biggest beekeeper meeting I've seen in Christchurch for quite a while. It's good to see. Um, interestingly, I was looking through the stats as I was coming down on the plane this morning, and it looks like the industry's picked up about something in the order of 1,200 newly registered beekeepers in the last two years, maybe in the last two and a half years. Um, some of those will be people who kept bees previously, got out of it for a while, and have got back in again. But most of the people, in, most of them will be new to the industry, most of them will be hobbyists, and most of them won't know very much about the or anything else. So it's just a, perhaps a message that people who have been in the industry for a long time, particularly on the commercial side, tend to assume there's a base level of knowledge about, not just about Varroa, but about managing American fowl brood some parts of the country managing the risk of toxic honey from certain. In fact, we need to get our mindset slightly out of the industry being having having a stable core of people who've always been there to an industry that's got a lot of new entrants which are bringing new ideas in but don't necessarily have the advantage of some of the existing knowledge that people take for granted. So that's something all of us can bear in mind. I'm not entirely sure why they invited me to speak here today. I think probably because I couldn't get anybody who was better. Um, the woman who has been organising this particular sustainable farming, farming fund project has just left the ministry and uh, I guess in a way I'm filling in for her slot. Uh, briefly, just by way of explanation, the sustainable farming fund was set up in the late 90s from memory. It has a budget of 10, 10 million, a little more than that each year and it's designed to support grassroots agricultural projects that will, as the title says, improve sustainability. The way it works is two application rounds each year. Uh, don't ask me which month because they've moved recently and I can't remember the new ones. Uh, groups that have a bright idea that they think might help their particular sector, it doesn't necessarily have to be a commercial, um, a commercial industry. There's various bits of environmental protection around the country that the fund has supported. Uh, put together an initial proposal which has to include some element of funding by the group seeking the money. Uh, the ministry will part share, but it usually likes at least 70 and preferably, sorry, at least, at least 30 and preferably up to 50% of the uh, project to be funded by the, by the group seeking it. Uh, there's an application, for, as I said, an application around twice a year. Generally, there's about 10 times as many applications as there are project, as there are available funds. But that said, the beekeeping industry has got an extremely strong track record. I would say for the size of the industry, it would have extracted more money from the Sustainable Farming Fund than any similar group. Uh, value of current projects, I think, is about 1.2 million, which is, which is very high. And there's been a number of projects in the past that have, um, that have not counted in that total. So for part of, if the bee industry has bright ideas for small small-scale trials that could you know, work towards sustainability, then, then it is a, a viable source of funding and one you ought to be aware of. Uh, I'll briefly mention, since, I've, since I'm on the, the topic of money, uh, it's now got a big brother called the uh, Primary Growth Partnership, which this government introduced three years ago. Uh, that's a slightly different fund. It's, it's, got, it's aimed at bigger projects. You're looking at uh, you're looking at million dollar plus projects, so the industry contribution would be typically half a million up. Uh, there's been one of those involving the bee industry, which involves uh, Manuka Honey, and with Combita has probably been the, the dominant industry partner in that. Uh, given the way the industry is currently structured, I think it would, it would struggle to find half a million dollars to kick in for an industry good type project, but you do need to be aware that there are opportunities out there. Uh, it's more just primary growth partnerships is perhaps less production driven, it's more aiming at the market and it's looking for areas where there's some particular bit of work that can give you a, a step change in productivity or a step change in the value of the end product. It's not really designed towards minor incremental improvements, it's designed to make a, a big leap forward. 
Um, and with, within that, I think there seems to be an awareness that <coughs> some of the things they fund probably aren't going to work. But uh, that, as long as the, the risks seem to be adequately managed, they're, they're prepared to accept that. Uh, these, are my, these are my speech notes, a little bit sketchy. I should perhaps say up, up front, I'm, I'm here today on behalf of the uh, Ministry for Primary Industries. Up until a month ago, I was in math, then they changed the letter here, sent around a new set of business cards, painted a new sign on the front door. According to rumour, it was going to be initially the Department of Primary Industries. People realised quickly that would make us dopey. <laughs> what about the Ministry of Primary Industries? It would be Moby. Well, that was an improvement, but there's more work to be done. A lot more brainstorming they've come up with. Ministry for Primary Industries, it's pretty hard to get an acronym out of that. So we're now mostly just the MPI. Uh, business will pretty much proceed as normal, I would expect, other than this several hundred fisheries related people wandering up and down the building wondering what they're doing. Uh, and we've also got Food Safety Authority merged back in, uh, which in some ways, given we work very closely with them in regard to the bee industry, uh, is probably a good thing. Uh, I should perhaps talk a little bit about the relationship between the bee industry and the government, given one from the government and one from the bee industry. It might be productive use of time. Uh, there's a lot of interactions in a lot of different areas. Um, I think one of the objectives of, well, it was interesting, they, the stated reason for the merger of, of those three agencies into the Ministry for Primary Industries was to improve efficiency for those of us who have been around a long time. When they split uh, food safety and fisheries off from, from MAF 15 years ago, that was also for reasons of efficiency. So I'm not quite sure what time they were right, but, uh, but we'll keep, keep, keep going regardless. Uh, I'll briefly run through a few issues, I think. This might, might be the most effective way of doing it. Where there's, uh, where there's currently work going on uh, that both the government and the industry have a, have a stake in. Uh, I'll start out perhaps with market access. For the last couple of years, I think over 50% of the New Zealand honey crop has been exported. Back in the, you know, a decade ago, the rule used to be a third was shipped out and a third was eaten here. Uh, now we've got 420,000 hives, we produce more honey than we used to. Uh, it's, now, it's now the majority of the crop in a good year would be exported. Uh, that means there's a lot of product going out and a lot of issues potentially coming up with trying to get it into overseas markets. Um, three that have emerged in the, that I guess ongoing at the moment, Pyrolidazine alkaloids, they are the alkaloids you find in, in Australia in Patterson's Curse, in New Zealand in Blue Borage or Viper's Blue Gloss. They're also found in a lot of other plants. Uh, lavender's got it, ragwort's got it, various natives have got it. These are a major concern of industry due to some uh, human toxicity events with people uh, consuming foods that natu they're naturally occurring toxins effectively. In Australia, Patterson's Curse, which is a very close cousin to Blue Borage, it's another echium. Um, regularly kills livestock who eat too much of it. Uh, that hasn't been the case in New Zealand with, with borage, so we're assuming that the toxins are now are less toxic, certainly to livestock and hopefully to people. The difficulty is that uh, unless we can prove that toxic, it's likely that EU residue limits will shut out a lot of New Zealand honey from the European Union. So that is one of the Sustainable Farming Fund projects that was approved in this most recent round. There's some work to look at the distribution of uh, <coughs> some plants containing these alkaloids in New Zealand and also do some work on the toxicology of the individual alkaloids, which is extremely expensive because they're there in such low concentrations. Getting enough of them out of, of the uh, plant to do the tox work is quite challenging and very expensive. Uh, another one that actually was brought to mind with that early discussion of sugar shaking is a variety control method. Uh, it's a test to distinguish whether your, the sugar in your honey has come out of out of uh, plant nectar or out of a sugar cane. Uh, C3, C4 test, which many of you all have uh, become perhaps unwittingly familiar with in recent times. New Zealand honey has been rejected from a number of markets, Europe, China, and the US included, uh, for registering positive test results for having uh, C4 cane sugar in. Now, there's several explanations for this. One is that the test is not very good. Uh, some honey, it would seem, high protein honey such as manuka in particular tends to throw a false positive. 
So even if there isn't any C4 sugar in the test, you could, you could uh, send up a positive signal. Uh, there's a researcher at IRL, I believe, one of the Crown CRI, one of the CRIs, has a project to improve the uh, internationally used test and get that accepted. Uh, AGMA, which is a funding body, is looking at putting some money into that at the moment. And if that work proceeds, that will certainly take out some of the positive results. Uh, the, the other source, and, and the other, but even with that test, we're pretty confident that some New Zealand honey even shipped out contains cane sugar. The reason in most cases is because people have been feeding their hives, particularly hives and pollination, up until right before the honey flow. The bees have transported some of that bee feed up into the supers. When it gets extracted, it's going into drums and it's getting picked up by the labs at the other end. In that case, we're going to have to change beekeeping practices. We're going to have to look at when we feed in relation to when we take off the honey crop. And that is you know, potentially going to drive some significant management changes for people involved in pollination of some crops, particularly kiwi for other early flowering crops. And particularly where they, where hives tend to go straight out of an orchard onto a honey flow, which is the case in many parts of the North Island. Uh, and additionally, we can't exclude the possibility that some people are just turning a bit of sugar syrup into their honey to make it go further. Um, that's the traditional form of adulteration in any overseas markets. It's never been a problem before in New Zealand. It's not the same couldn't happen. And, and a fourth way, which I hadn't really considered until, until about 15 minutes ago, if you're sugar shaking using icing sugar for variety control, um, there is obviously potential if you're doing that when your supers are on, or immediately before your supers go on, that some of that could go through into your honey. Now, I don't know enough about the amounts of sugar you'd be using. Obviously, if you're using this sugar, if you're a hobbyist, this is not an issue. You're not, you're not selling your honey and then you're not shipping it to anywhere that's gonna have a, a high power lab looking for cane sugar in there. But if you're a commercial beekeeper thinking about going down the sugar shaking track, that is something you ought to have to talk to your exporter about because there is potential to um, get market rejections there. Now, with all of these issues, the body that uh, MPI is working with is the Bee Product Standards Council. And uh, that was a body set up to work, you know, to act as a sort of a go-between between the bee industry and the um, and the Food Safety Authority as it was then, and they work well at, um, at resolving these issues as they emerge. Um, but an issue, an ongoing issue, and I'll come back to this, is money. Uh, in issues like this, the government is expecting the industry is going to kick in a reasonable contribution to the work that's going on, figuring the industry's got you know, a very strong incentive to get the problem sorted out. Uh, that isn't going to change, you know, people say the government will change, the government will change eventually, but that imperative to get funding from industry is probably not going to go away. At the moment, there's any time there's even a relatively small call on industry funds, there's a desperate effort to pass the hat around. What happens is the same small group of willing contributors tend to get hit up again and again and again, and the same people who don't pay continue to not pay, and in the belief that somebody else will sort out the problem for them. Uh, up until now that has been the case, but with some of the issues that have emerged recently, semi-carbazide is one that would canvas the depth at the, uh, at the conference and data, I won't go into that just because of time. Uh, there are, as, as lab testing technology improves, people are finding more and more stuff in honey that makes them nervous. That means that at the production end in New Zealand, we're having to do more and more work to reassure them that honey is still safe. That dynamic isn't going to change, so the demand for more funds to produce evidence that the honey is safe is going to be an ongoing one. Uh, and the passing around of the hat is, is only going to cut it for so long, I think. Until 1992, <coughs> until 2002, the bee industry had uh, industry good levy that funded American Failbury Control, the running of the National Beekeepers Association, some marketing activities and some research activities through uh, the Commodity Levies Act. It's not really the place of the government to tell you how you ought to be funding this stuff, but I, I think it's reasonable for us to signal that there's going to be a constant call for funds, and the current sort of voluntary uh, ad hoc methods of collecting them are probably not very efficient. You really, as a group, as an industry, you need to look at what stuff that you need to collectively fund and how you can do it better, because I don't think the current system is, is, is particularly satisfactory. Uh, Enough on that. 
American Fowl Group, people, people are, are maybe aware that we've had an American Fowl Group strategy review that's been running for almost as long as the American Fowl Group strategy. Uh, I would say I'm proud of that, but it's, it's a notable achievement nonetheless. Uh, we provided some recommendations to the Minister on, on that famous log running review. Uh, we thought we'd better get him before he changed his office. Um, I think he's the third minister to oversee this review. Um, that essentially recommend the strategy gets fine-tuned a bit in relatively minor ways, but should continue, that there's industry support for it. Uh, that certainly came through in the submissions. Uh, if anybody can remember writing one so long ago. Uh, assuming he follows the recommendations, and I expect he will for most of them at least, uh, he will then issue a response requesting us to draft him a letter to the Parliamentary Council's office, other people who actually write the laws, they'll draft the new order of council over the and it's got to pass through, I guess, the legislative machinery, get signed by the Governor General or laid before the House, and I would estimate that will take five or six months, so that will take till sometime around Christmas to get a new strategy in place. Uh, on top of that review, which, as I said, is mostly recommending a bit of fine-tuning, uh, some of the things off the top of my head, uh, changing the requirement on uh, apiary locations from 260 series map references to GPS references, uh, simplifying the process by which the management agency, that's the NBA, um, has to follow before it can destroy um, unidentified or abandoned hives, uh, giving them a bit more flexibility about how they target their inspections. What else? A few other, a few other reasonably minor things like that. We're recommending they get one through one uh, controlled area notice powers, which would enable some movement controls to be put in if you've got significant areas that have a uh, low or no varroa, varroa American fowlbird in. In addition to those changes, uh, the Biosecurity Act has been amended with the Biosecurity Law Reform Bill, which is due to go before the House sometime later this year. That's also going to make some changes, uh, significant ones you probably need to think about. Uh, any future strategies of called, called pest management plans. I've got no idea if that's retrospective and whether we have to change the name or not, but it makes no difference. Uh, the strategy, management agencies for strategy, which is currently the NBA, come under the Official Information Act, which means people can request official information about the strategy and it has to be released unless there's good reasons, you know, particularly around privacy where it can't be. That's going to place some additional uh, requirements and costs on the management agency around its record keeping. And uh, part and parcel of that, the strategy will also come under the office of the Ombudsman. So if anybody thinks they've been uh, badly screwed over or unjustly treated by the strategy, they'll be able to complain to the Ombudsman. I know the Ombudsman is a, a very busy chap, or chap S, and uh, the threshold for getting complaints and set is pretty bloody high, but that, that does, that will exist. Uh, okay. Probably a the Falbury review. Um, I, I'll, I'll accept all complaints about the length of time. They're all perfectly justified. Uh, government industry agreements. That's a, a proposal by the government to come up with agreements with a whole range of different sectors. The bee industry is, is just one of many players there, whereby plans for what happens if a, a pest or disease incursion occurs are developed to a greater degree ahead of time. Essentially, the government is saying, we'll develop more detailed plans if you'll help us pay for them. In return, we'll give you more control over managing such responses. Uh, the stage that industries are at at the moment is signing up to MOUs, Memoranda of, Memoranda of Understanding, where, which doesn't bind them into anything. It binds them to go looking at, looking at it in more detail. I won't go into any more on that because John Hartnell was one of the uh, Fed Farmers representatives on the working group, and you know far more about it than I do, and he's speaking later today. Uh, Australian honey, this has fallen off the radar. It's a long time since anybody's written me an angry letter about this, but I'm sure it'll all start again, sooner or later. Uh, as you remember from, from the 90s, uh, Australia has been trying to get its honey into the New Zealand market. Uh, back in 2000, and not very much, MAF issued import health standard for Australian honey, essentially on the back of data showing that if you heat treat to a certain degree, you can kill the European fowl brood. Uh, bee industry and took MAF to court, lost, appealed, won. Uh, there was an independent review panel recommended that MAF did additional work on three organisms, respectively Panobacillus alvei, Nasema serrani, and Israeli acute paralysis virus. They thought 
these are all actually things that emerged after the original risk analysis and which were, you know, had to be treated retrospectively by MAF. Uh, so MAF, first of all, looked to see if these things were in New Zealand, found the first two, uh, P. alvei was here, Nassima Serrano was here, Israeli Q. Paralysis as virus as wasn't here. I, when I was in Napier a week ago, two weeks ago, I encountered, and I hadn't realised this was going around, a conspiracy theory that Nassima Serrano isn't really here, it was planted by MAF or the, the test results were wrong or something, and therefore, it was just we're just given a positive. Uh, you know, we'd announced it was here, so we'd get the Australian honey in. I'm not quite sure what's driving that, but uh, is that better? I can actually see you now. There are a lot of people here. Uh, uh, we had we were approached by a group of North Island beekeepers expressing concern about the test results sometime last year. Uh, in response, at their request, we sent off a bunch of samples to. Uh, Jeff Pettis at the USDA in Maryland and asked him to see if we had no semi serrano and we sent a whole lot off to a lab in Sweden, the name of the guy alluded to me at this moment, to see what he thought of it. We thought respectively they were the, the, the main labs in Europe and North America. They both found no semi serrano in the same samples we found and so there's no question we've got no semi serrano so if, you're, if you've given any credence to the belief that it's not really here then you probably need to adjust your opinions accordingly. Um, the main thing is it doesn't seem to affect, affect bees very much differently to Apis serrano, which is the sort of, the sort of nosema that we've always had. Broadly speaking, it's in most places it's doing much the same kind of thing. Um, so that leaves one, Israeli acute paralysis virus. The, the first part of MAF's work, as recommended by the review panel, was to see whether it was here. It doesn't appear to be. The second part was to see whether the heat treatment we were requiring for European fowl brood would kill it. Uh, and we can't do that work here, of course, because it's not here. So we contracted a lab in the UK to do that, and they were going to do it in, in a jiffy about two or three years, two years ago, I think. It turned out to be an awful lot more difficult than anybody thought. I understand the difficulties of getting the virus out of the bees alive and into the honey. It seems to be a sensitive wee beast. Um, so that, and if you're not wanting Australian honey to come in, is probably a good thing. The downside of that is the virus appears to be so fragile that as soon as you take it out of a bee it dies, the chance it's not going to be killed by two hours at 60 degrees in a heat tank is probably pretty bloody low. So if that were, if the if the research is carried to its conclusion, then the remaining uh, the remaining organisms between you and a whole lot of honey that tastes like uh, cough syrup is probably gone. Uh, what worries me a little bit is not that this honey will come in, which it may well do, unless there's further developments, but that nobody seems to be prepared for that to happen in the industry. Because it's been talked about for so long, people assume it's something that's going to be talked about forever. Uh, obviously, we don't have a particularly strong incentive to raise it at beekeeper meetings, because people just yell at us, uh, but I will. Um, people need to, be, need to be thinking about that, that there is potential that honey could come in, and you need to think about what that will mean for the New Zealand industry. Uh, I don't know what it will mean for the New Zealand industry, but I think it's safe to say that Australian honey is currently fetching much lower prices on the world market than New Zealand honey. Not being a marketing genius, I couldn't go through the full implications of that, but it seems to me that if you're selling honey on price in New Zealand, you know, you've got a word like PAMS or budget on the front of your jar, then, the, then your product is very, very vulnerable to competition because there's no question they can do it cheaper than you. Uh, what they can't seem to do though, based you know, on world market prices, is do it better than you. So what is, I think, a plausible scenario is that cheap Aussie honey would take out the bottom rung of the New Zealand market, meaning more New Zealand honey would be pushed into export markets, if, if it happened. I mean, I don't want to go any further than that, it's purely my speculation, but it's something that I'm just amazed that nobody in the industry seems to be thinking about it all, because uh, it's better to, I guess it's better to think about it possible adverse things before they happen rather than afterwards. Uh, top bar hives, this is something I do get a lot of letters about and which to me illustrates the fact that beekeepers worry about anything except what's important. Um, I've had more, more letters, I've got to say, probably by a factor of about 10 about top bar hives than I have about varroa resistance to chemicals and I've got to say that I, you know, which of the two is the more important for the industry? I know I've got my views but it's not the same views as the people who are writing me letters. Um, People ask what the government position is on these things, and I don't think we've got a position, that we're trying to figure one out. My view is, 
the first time I encountered top bar hives was when I was an apiary officer in Auckland back in the 90s. There was one um, one elderly gentleman who had been keeping a top bar hive somewhere in the inner suburbs of Auckland for longer than I've been alive. And um, and, and they, were, they were perfectly good for bees, a pleasure to inspect, always gave me a lovely cup of tea, and I never, other than it being a bit eccentric, I never thought anything of it. A few more people over the years tried it. I generally found after about two years they would converted their top bar hive to a herb planter after it all got welded together into one big mat, mass of wax and honey and then they got stung up trying to get the frames out again. Uh, they'd given it away. But there's no question if you do it right, you can keep more or less movable frame hives, uh, movable, movable combs in a hive. Um, should the government outlaw them? Well, I haven't seen any particularly strong reason why. Um, the, the, the rules governing what sort of hive you can use are found within the American Fowl Group Pest Management Strategy, strangely enough, so we probably will have to make some sort of statement on this as part of the review. Uh, since, from memory, 1906, it's been a legal requirement in New Zealand to keep, frames, keep bees in a movable frame hive, and that was because back then, sort of a couple of decades after Fowl Group arrived, it went through New Zealand like a dose of something you wouldn't want to go through, and uh, something like 70% of the country's hives died. And uh, because they were mostly kept in wooden boxes, I mean, people have romantic ideas about the woven straw skeps. Um, mostly people weren't very good at weaving, not as good as history would have you believe. Uh, reading some contemporary accounts, it seemed like the two most popular, the two most popular containers for, um, for keeping bees in back around the turn of that century were um, reported as being wooden boxes previously used for dynamite or gin. <laughs> Cast quite an interesting light on the old pioneer days, doesn't it? <laughs> well, those were the most abundant supplies of wooden packaging available. You wonder what life was like. I mean, back then. You'd hope they wouldn't have mixed them too often. <laughs> so, after a long, and I've got to say, a fight that makes any kind of internal battle the industry's had since 1906, exceedingly bitter struggle, uh, the, the modernizers won, and keeping hives just in straight boxes with no frames, or in woven baskets was outlawed. Uh, the, the whole point of that is you can get the combs out and inspect them for the disease and stick them back again without the world ending. Um, for me, any, any hive that meets that requirement, which is a pretty minimal one, should probably be okay. On the, you know, as, as enthusiasts of top bar hives point out, mostly that, or oh, in New Zealand exclusively, they're kept by hobbyists who tend not to have large numbers of hives, or they wouldn't be hobbyists anymore. They tend not to be moved around and they tend not to interchange stuff between the hives very much, not particularly if they're making them themselves because it won't fit. But, um, but uh, so essentially there's no, yeah, there's no particular reason to think that top bar hives are going to cause the death of the New Zealand bee industry through the scourge of the American fowl group sweeping from the suburbs out into the hinterland or something like that, which some of my correspondents fear. On the other hand, I think it's reasonable to expect, you know, and, and a concern for the management agency that it's their job to make sure Fowl group is controlled, they've got legal responsibilities. Part of that is ensuring that beekeepers meet their legal responsibilities to have their hives inspected every year you know, by the owner or by an agent of the owner who's um, approved to do that. And that if you're doing a disease or thyroid or inspection in an area, people can come in and get into those hives. So I think where we'll probably go is boost up the wording in the requirement to keep movable frame hives to make sure that the However the hive is designed, they've got to be bloody removable without you know, too much hacking and chopping. But try and try and get away from the angle that you need, it necessarily needs to be a rectangular wooden frame of X dimensions. So I, that's, you know, that's not the official position, but that's probably where I think the official position will go to. I think if people want to keep hives in different, different forms, I think that's, it's nice to see a bit of, a bit of innovation. How, how sustainable it is, I don't know. I, mean, I don't particularly regard it a sort of a long skinny hive as being necessarily more natural than a, a tall stacking up hive. They're both artificial devices constructed to house bees for the convenience of humans. So so you sort of you sort of take your pick really as to which direction you want the hive to go. I don't know that that's something the government ought to be dictating for you. Uh, chemical registrations, that is a, a significant regulatory role of the government. Mark mentioned checkmite, which is an organophosphate, which is a class of chemicals that New Zealand Broadly speaking, it's trying to class, you know, move out of use because of the residue profile and the fact that, generally speaking, toxic to humans to a much greater degree than the chemicals we like to use. 
It is wide, yeah, check marks widely used in the US, but I know they didn't, certainly at the time, and I think subsequently didn't get a full EPA registration. They kind of snuck it around the back door through registering some states for experimental use or something like that, and then gradually widened its ambit of use. They obviously had difficulties getting it through their approval system, and that was 15 years plus ago. Uh, Industry needs to be aware that even if, and I think, I think it's time for the industry to have a conversation about whether it should be used. Last time, Bayer put it forward, the industry organisations knocked it back. Uh, because standards on residue testing and chemicals are progressively getting tightened, I think you need to be aware that even if industry supports it going forward, yeah, supports Bayer putting it back into the mix, it may not make it through. It'll be an interesting conversation to have with the Environmental Protection Agency and the Air Compounds and Veterinary Medicines Unit and MPI. But it is it is timely for the, for the industry to think about this now rather than rather than let it sit. Um, I'm slightly crossing out the things on my list. Uh, we'll go over the biggie. Uh, MAF industry relations in general. I think MAF, yeah, MAF interact various bits of MPI interact with various bits of the bee industry in a pretty amicable and productive manner most of the time. We obviously have our, our differences, but usually work through them. Uh, what, what is a bit of a factor though, and I think I think the minister, the minister said something to this effect at, uh, at the conference, so I can probably say it without too much fear, uh, even though he's the assisting minister, the associate minister rather than the actual minister, uh, is that you don't get a sense with the bee industry, unlike some industries, you don't get a sense there's a, a strong industry led body that's got a clear vision of where the industry's trying to get to and how it's going to get there. Everything is dealt with pretty much on a ad hoc, piecemeal, issue by issue uh, arrangement. And that's partly as a result of the split of the MBA back in 2002. Um, partly, but even more greatly, I think, a result of the large majority of beekeepers not being a member of either body, and I certainly encourage people who aren't members of either body to join one, or if not both of them. Uh, it's partly a result of having a commercial industry that's got a lot of hives, but only a small number of beekeepers, sort of occupying the same ground as a hobbyist sector that's got a lot of people but not many hives. Uh, that's not unique to the bee industry. Uh, the pig industry, which I've had some uh, dealings with recently, there are, I believe, about 300 commercial piggeries in New Zealand, but somewhere between seven and 15,000 pig owners who you know, have one or two in the backyard. So their position is not dissimilar. The difference is they have a specific um, <coughs> body that only covers commercial pig farmers and is funded by a levy on all pigs slaughtered, all commercial pigs slaughtered in New Zealand. And uh, they're, a, they're a formidable lobbying force. Of, um, if they want to spend a million dollars on lawyers, as they recently did, or so we need to believe, um, taking take me to court or taking my organisation to court, then they've got the million dollars to do it. Uh, it's a very different picture of the bee industry. And while I'm not encouraging you to spend a million dollars taking the organisation I work for court, <laughs> the fact that they, if you go on their website, and that's something I would recommend, NZ Pork, and go on the industry section rather than the recipe section, yeah, although the recipe section actually has a lot to recommend it as well, but just don't go there when you're hungry. I do this at work sometimes, you click in there, finding out, finding out what they're doing at the moment, and immediately I feel like I have to whip out for a pie before I go any further. Um, the, the sort of, and you know, the monthly reports they produce for their members on how much pork was shipped in, how much was sold, what were the range of prices, it's staggering the detail they've got and the sort of data they can use their, their members can access to drive the decision making. It's, it's genuinely impressive. And again, I don't know if this is where the bee industry needs to go. This, you know, the circumstances between the two industries are quite different. But I think it's, it will be prudent for beekeepers collectively to think about, are you organized? You know, if you were starting fresh, would you end up with the structures you've got now? And if not, you know, are, there a better way of, are there better ways of organizing yourselves? I, my, my, View to both those questions is it's probably not how you would have ended up if you're starting from design. And there probably are better ways of doing it, but I don't think it's the government's job to try and figure that out. I think the industry needs to needs to work out what's important to it and what kind of structures will work with it. You know, you know, you know your own business better than anyone in Wellington does. But the industry could, you know, I think, well, the fact the MBAs managed to get 
you know, reasonably substantial sustainable farming fund funding to run this project over many years, uh, and to lobby the government along with Feds, the industry group, you know, shows that shows that the current structure certainly can deliver a lot of things to the industry. The question is whether you could make changes or do more. I, I think I'll leave you with that thought. I don't have the definite answer. My own view is probably yes, but uh, it's something the industry I think needs to reflect on. How are we doing for time? Ten minutes. Questions. <laughs> <laughs> I could keep going, but that kind of probably the enthusiasm was more long ago. At the back. <laughs> PLBI, um, PLBI, the Seamus Serrani and Israeli Q Prowls as far as so you want me to talk about one of them. No, PLBI, that's commonly No. PLBI was originally believed back in the back in the first half of the 20th century to be the cause of aging <coughs> EFB. But then it was found it dislikes living in larvae that have been killed by EFB. It sits in there and uh, multiplies. But it's in Matt's view, um, it's, a, it's a, a bacteria that feeds on dead material and can, can exist in a wide range of organisms. The last time I looked up um, recent finds in the scientific literature, there were three. One was in a HIV compromised drug addict's hip replacement in Florida, I think. <laughs> Florida, somewhere in the southern US. A bowl of rotting tomatoes in India and the mouth of a healthy dog in Japan. So this is an organism that gets around. It's not what you call a typical bee disease. Um, industry, industry and submissions to the court have argued that it, if it's, well, argued that it wasn't present in New Zealand, and if it was here, it would overgrow, well, first of all, it masks, it can, at least in the international literature, produce similar symptoms to American fowlbrood. So the theory is, we've got European fowlbrood, this will grow in the European fowlbrood larvae and give you symptoms that look like American fowlbrood and thus bugger up your pest management strategy. In practice, we've found that in three widely separated points of the North Island, I, I don't know whether we've got the South Island fines or not, but we haven't really been looking too hard since we found it three times. Uh, and so far it doesn't, in, in some parts of the world, including Australia, I understand when they're growing up, American fowlbrood on agar plates in the lab, they've actually got to add something to inhibit the growth of Panabacillus alvei. We don't do that in New Zealand. Um, presumably it's not around in beehives to the same degree, which is a strong argument for us. We don't have EFB here, I guess it's probably the conclusion I would draw from that. But it does appear to be, it's you know, been found in apiaries in Auckland and Wanganui and in bumblebees in the Bay of Plenty, I think. But it's not the causative organism of EFB, it just seems to hitch along to the right. Ha! Stunned into silence. All all it sense us more likely. But I, I will get off the stage then because both Mark and Michelle have actually been doing the research and got much more I think, useful things to talk about than me. So with, with no further ado, I'll, I'll see you all at the tea break, no doubt, and I'll hand over to Barry to introduce Michelle. Thank you.